Hello, my name is John Linze. I'm a follower of the podcast from Colombia, and I have a question for the clinical problem solvers. When should I correct sodium in the setting of hyperglycemia, and whether I have to use measured or corrected sodium for the calculation of osmolality? Thank you. John Linze, thank you so much for your question. I am so honored that you're listening to us from Colombia. So the question was when to use the corrected sodium in the setting of hyperglycemia. Let's start basic. Sodium, by the way, this is a bit awkward because people are watching me record myself. In any case, sodium is one of the major osmos that contributes to osmolality. Why do we care about osmolality? Well, the body tightly regulates osmolality because if the osmolality goes up, your cells will shrink their intracellular volume will decrease and that will impair their cellular function. If the osmolality goes down, water enters the cell and it expands the cell leading to edema and again, it will lead to impaired cellular function. That's why we care about osmolality. So under normal circumstances, you can estimate the serum osmolality by taking two and multiplying it by sodium. So what happens in the setting of increased glucose which might occur in a patient with diabetes who has relative insulin deficiency. So you have sodium and glucose that are extracellular and because this patient doesn't have insulin all of a sudden glucose becomes a particle or an, and contributes to the overall osmolality. So we've effectively increased the osmolality or the concentration of the extracellular fluid. So which way does water travel? Water travels in this direction. And what happens when water leaves from the intracellular component to the extracellular component? This sodium gets diluted. So you can no longer use this equation to estimate osmolality. Because if you use this equation, you're dealing with a diluted sodium that you're not correcting for glucose. Thereby, you would underestimate the serum osmolality. So what equation should you use? Well, one opportunity, one option is to measure the serum osmolality, but before that serum osm returns from the lab, you can use this equation where now you're accounting for the glucose. You could always use this equation, but under normal circumstances, when the glucose is 90 to 100, it only contributes five osmols to the serum osmolality. Why, did, why is this number 18? Well, it happens to be the molecular weight of glucose is 180 grams per mole. So to determine the number of osmols that glucose is contributing, you take the concentration and you divide it by its molecular weight. Okay, very good. So what do we mean when we say corrected sodium? This is a very confusing topic, and John Lintz, thank you so much for raising this question because I learned in the process of creating uh, this response. Basically, because water is leaving the cell and coming extracellularly and diluting the sodium, we want to correct for this dilutional factor. That's what's referred to as corrected sodium, correcting for the dilutional, correcting for the dilution caused by the hyperglycemia. In 1973, one, one study reported a correcting factor of 1.6 milliequivalents per liter of sodium for every rise in 100 grams per deciliter of glucose. In 1999, it suggested that you should correct by 2.4. So somewhere in between this range, you should correct the sodium. So for example, if the sodium was 120, and the glucose, let's do something easy, was 500. That means the glucose is 400 above what you expect. And let's just say we're gonna correct by a factor of two for every 100. So two times four equals eight. So now your corrected sodium is 128. Okay, with me? Of course you can't respond, so I'm just gonna assume you're with me. Um, now, when you're treating the sodium concentration in a setting of hyperglycemia, should you use the corrected sodium or the measured sodium? You should definitely use the corrected sodium for two reasons. Remember, 
the corrected sodium is accounting for what glucose is doing. If you use the measured sodium, which is diluted by this intracellular fluid, and you give the patient hypertonic saline because they appear hyponatremic based on the measurement, you are going to make that patient hypertonic because you're not accounting for glucose's contribution to serum osmolality. That's one reason. Another reason, what happens when you correct the glucose? Well, if you take away this tonic particle, now the concentration has decreased extracellularly, so water is going to shift back into the cell and the sodium concentration is going to rise. That's why you don't want to treat the measured sodium in the setting of hyperglycemia. If you treat it and you correct the glucose, your sodium is going to overshoot significantly. Finally, when we talk about anion gap acidosis, should we use the corrected or should we use the measure? In this circumstance, remember, the dilutional effect that glucose is having on the sodium, it's also having on the bicarb and the chloride. Therefore, you should use the measured sodium, not the corrected. If you use the corrected sodium, it's going to overestimate the anion gap. So to summarize, thank you for listening to us from Columbia. When you have a patient that's hyperglycemic and you want to determine the serum osmolality, use this equation and also measure the serum osmolality. When you're treating the sodium concentration, follow the corrected sodium so you don't overshoot. And when you're calculating the anion gap, use the measured because the dilutional effect of the glucose affects our negatively charged particles as well. Clinical Problem Solvers, thank you for listening. Please uh, send us more questions. Thank you. Yes! <laughs>